Hey, man. How's it going? Oh, not too bad about yourself. Excellent. No, I just saving out. I was just coming off a um, a uh, a Zoom call and I'm saving and loading to the paper. That's what was taking me some time. Oh yeah, no no problem. No I couldn't problem. set one up while I was saving in the same. No, I had a bunch of different things. And of course, they all happen at different times when you're unaware. So I had a my uh, my little uh, orientation this morning. Yep. And then uh, I got to pick up Ivy. Leave here at four. And uh, then Shannon Rupert called to say to wish me well and all that. And so, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, Kevin Smith came on there. And of course, you think yeah. it's a real thing until, until the whole thing fucked up. And they're like, oh, I'll have to start it again. I'm like, ah, it's a pre tape. Like, fuck off. Like, we have a special <laughs> guest because like, he introduced it. We have a special guest of like, and everyone's like, everyone, like, there's 150 people on there, like, holy fuck, blah, blah. And again, half yeah. of them because their kids have no idea who he is. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, at the same time, I'm like, uh, and it starts, and then the the audio goes. I'm like, and everyone's like, audio's out, and they go, oh, "I'll have to do this again." And then you can see he's, he's kind of leery about doing this again, but he has to reset it, and then he starts it from. He goes, "I'll just you know start it from the beginning." I'm like, "Fuck up! He's not <laughs> there. He's not there. It's a re-recorded thing." Like you think it would? Like you think they would have built that into it? But like, like, like when they're like, okay, okay, I got something to show you. We got a special guest today, and the guy hits play, and it just opens like this, right? And then you have Kevin Smith go, "Oh no, another," you know. And at least then there's a, you know, there's a bit of a thing, right? Let's yeah. See kids again, God. Yeah, that was pretty funny. He was there in '92. Yeah, he was there for about a week <laughs> and then decided he didn't, I don't know what, he, he didn't have the money or he didn't have the aptitude or what, but. I don't know. He goes on there as their the biggest cheerleader. That's and, great. That's, and then his, Neil that, that's his house there he's shooting from for sure. Yeah, Neil Blankenkamp or whatever the hell it is went there and uh, a couple of other guys. Uh, one of uh, Kevin Smith's right-hand guys that he worked with, he went and directed The Grinch. Mosier, yeah. Mosier, yeah, Scott Mosier. Came from there and all that. So that's kind of cool. Funny. He met his producer there, yeah. Yeah. So we picking up with... Uh, Let's do Kill Bill. Killing Bill. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, we kind of uh, we, we kind of uh, wrapped it up where, uh, I mean, he, he went into a six-year hiatus because uh, everyone was saying he was in the media overload, so he took a break, but then also he was going back... Who was, between, who was pregnant, so... Yeah, and then and he was vacillating between going uh, doing Inglorious Bastards then or doing Kill Bill. Well, again, and Inglorious, I mean, he had that in the works for 10 years. Like, he basically wrote, worked on that script for 10 years. And, uh, again, you know, it all paid out in the end. But this whole thing, again, this is another, you know, you can't help. I mean, a lot of the stuff that Tarantino watches, you kind of get the idea. I mean, it's not, you know, he's 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 watching everything, you know. He's kind of like me, like kind of like a, a garbage brain where you just kind of grab anything that kind of looks good that you're going to get your thrill of. Because it's not a lot of, a lot of the stuff is kind of lower, like almost grindhouse cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or like a lot of the lesser notes, especially the stuff that he's quoting or the movies that he's saying really inspired him. Most people would never have heard of. I mean, fuck, I had to fucking look up a lot of the names and go, okay, I, you know, I've been in the video store my entire life and I never came across this one. But we're talking like 60s and 70s, uh, mostly Boy. a lot of this stuff. And because, uh, I mean, because yeah. he got to start in the 90s. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's where he had to pull from. So, uh, but uh, from th this one basically is a side. Now there's a movie called The Bride Wore Black. Now, this is one that I know I've seen, but I can't remember, but I should remember because it's iconic. Like if you talk about the story, it's the same story here, uh, the bride's backstory. Yeah. So this story is written by Quentin Tarantino and then the character of the bride uh, and her backstory was come up between uh, Tarantino and Uma Thurman. Uma Thurman's got a writing uh, credit for this. And uh, basically if you've seen a movie from 1973, 1974 called The Bride Wore Black, again, uh, it's a revenge film, kind of like I Spit on Your Grave, except uh, five men come and kill her husband shortly after they get married. And of course, she makes a list and she comes back after them. So, uh, and again, it's done at a church and all that. So, I mean, obviously, he's lifting from this material or is inspired by this material, um, which is awesome stuff. So, again, that's kind of where the crux of this one comes in. And then he's inspired. I mean, this one is kind of a, a, a cross genre thing, whereas, you know, from Dust Till Dawn, we had kind of the, the, the serial killer, kind of like California road trip. And then we have vampires. With this one, we have a couple of different things going on. So we have the revenge, the classic revenge tale, and then we have um, we have um, samurai. Yeah, we have the samurai. So we have all the Sunny Chiba stuff that's Ooh. going on here. And again, it, they they come in there. So Bill is the mythical, uh, you know, the the be all end all, the guy that runs the whole thing. Um, 
again, in this case, we have David Carradine, like when they talked about the amount of people that were actually going to be cast as Bill. So yeah. we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, Burt Reynolds at one point, uh, we had Kevin Costner, we had, uh, I know uh, Warren Beatty was supposed to be him, we figured they kind of played more like a James Bond, and then Every time he's talking to Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty's, uh, he's telling Warren Beatty, do it like David Carradine. And Warren Beatty finally goes, well, you just get David Carradine to do the role. So hence we have, uh, we have this. Um, another, another resurrection. Of yeah. And in this first part, you actually never see David Carradine. You see his hands, if they're really his hands, I'm not sure, but you hear his voice. Yeah. And the rest of it, you've got to cast uh, Vivica A. Fox, Daryl Hannah, uh, Michael Madsen, Lucy Liu. Uh, Uma Thurman, of course, um, Michael uh, Parks, Michael Parks' son uh, is in it. And uh, of course, that's kind of, the, and then you got Sonny Chiba. So that's kind of kind of the core cast. There's lots of other inspired uh, Asian cinema stars in there that most aren't familiar with. I know I had to look a lot of them up. And Parks is playing the same character as he did in From Dust Till Dawn as well. Pretty close. Yep. Yeah, pretty close. Or and again, well, he's got two roles. I mean, and, and, yes, then, yes, and then in part two, he's, he's the Mexican cantina. So which was the last scene that they I always wonder if they just tacked that on there because the last thing that they filmed. Yeah. So uh, with this one, again, he takes a simple idea of of a revenge, like the ideas are very simple. Like we talked about, he takes the idea of the revenge, you know, inspired by the live bride board black, I'm assuming and kind of takes it from there. It creates these five in, uh, incredible serial killers. And again, they're all named after snakes, you know, Black Mamba, Copperhead. Uh, Sidewinder. Uh, yeah, Sidewinder, whatever. And uh, goes from there. So again, the story is, is that uh, same, same story is that her husband uh, and her were murdered on their wedding day by these uh, cartel people that she used to work with. And now she's made a list and she's going to kill Bill. And Checking it twice. Yep. Yeah. So basically it's divided into two parts. Originally he wanted to film the whole thing as one big thing and then kind of make it an epic with a, with an intermission. And then that went by the wayside and then it was serials and that went by the wayside. And of course, when you get to the end of part two, you realize that there's more story to tell there or another next generation or whatever you want to talk about. Mm. Um, but uh, once we get into uh, the Kill Bill, we're into the first couple of, of kills. And again, uh, of the two parts, this one is definitely, to me, I don't know about you, uh, the stronger of the two. Uh, definitely, it's the better definitely, film. The other one's the better, better film movie. in general. Yeah. 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 And again, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the Lucy Liu uh, Crazy 88 part, the, yep. the real Japanese homage there. So uh, that's pretty cool. Because the first one, you, you, you were introduced to the character of Vivica A. Fox. And then uh, you're introduced, uh, uh, Lucy Liu, I think are the first two. And then the other three, Copper or uh, Michael Madsen, um, uh, Daryl Hannah, and, uh, or is Daryl Hannah? No, Daryl Hannah. Daryl Hannah second. shows up in both because she's, uh, she's got the, uh, the De Palma sequence. Yes, hospital. that's right. Uh, and then, uh, so basically it's a revenge on the first two and then the next three are in the next film. So, and again, yep. you're with this one, you're getting the backstory, you're getting a lot of flashbacks, you're getting a lot of who she is, a lot of character development. And then the second film part two, uh, you're basically getting the next three characters. And of course the, epi the, the big, the big climax with Bill, like what's going to happen with yeah. Bill. And, so. uh, and this one, uh, this is, I mean, there's time shift trickery and all that. Uh, not as much as uh, say the first two movies of his, but uh, this one is in the order he wrote it. I mean, again, he's really tipping his hand that list that, 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 um, well, the bride makes is going to use a real name. Uh, that's flat out how he plotted out this, this screenplay. It's that mm -hmm. simple. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that that's probably his handwriting and uh, that's his notebook even. Um, and yeah, there's some spaghetti Western and uh, black exploitation in this one, too. Um, but it's oh, ab certainly absolutely. has had into the um, into the action uh, direction for sure. Yeah, the, 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 the spaghetti Western, the Japanese Western. In fact, Tarantino did a film shortly before, shortly after called uh, Sukiyaki, uh, Suki, Sukiyaki Django Western. Yeah, it was basically that, and he actually star he actually stars in it, yeah. Or he is, he has a supporting role in it, and uh, I it I've seen so many. Of the, I know I saw it, uh, didn't make much of an impression. It was kind of a cool film. I mean, when you watch uh, a lot of these films, some of them will just vanquish from memory, and then of course you're always left with the strong parts that kind of stick yeah. with you. Uh, uh, and this again, this these both of these films are incredibly strong and incredibly entertaining especially when you look at the run time to keep people that occupied and that tied in for that amount of time uh part one more so than part two yep but still part two has 
more of the payoff. That's you're tuned in. Part one could it makes more sense to have part one be stronger just because you're already you're already tied in for part two, right? If you and let's face it, both titles give away what's going to be happening. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and again, uh, if you go with three, uh, which again, whether it's going to come or not, or become a serial or whatever, like it's I I believe that the whole thing is Vivica A. Fox's daughter. Yeah, uh, coming after uh, uh, com coming after the bride. So and her daughter. And yep. her daughter, yeah. And then so, you got to, and then you realize there's a couple characters that, uh, you know, not that we're going to give them away, but come the end of the second movie, they're still alive. Yeah, there are. I mean, there's at least again, two. With this, with yeah. this, with this casting, you're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of, uh, again, Tarantino's uh, troop there. So Michael Madsen's back again. Yep. Uh, you've got Uma Thurman back again. Uh, to the time, this was um, uh, Samuel Jackson apparently has a he's small, tiny the, cameo. He, He's the he's the piano player at the wedding. Yeah, he's the piano player, and uh, the who's playing and who's the pastor is somebody famous uh, the too. The pastor, I think, is Bo Svensson, isn't it? Yes, it is. Is Bo Svensson is the pastor? Yeah. So there, there's the whole thing. And of course, you know, how do you get in the movie? I don't know. Just kind of put it in there. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, this one again, you can see there's there's digressions here where you realize, oh my god, oh you know, the, the, his, 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 his digression or, or uh, you know, side plot all of a sudden goes 25 minutes and then you realize, oh, right, that has nothing to do <laughs> with Kill Bill. Like, uh, I can think of two distinct ones here where they go into the Jap Japanimation sequence of one of the, uh, the history of one of the characters. And then when, um, when the bride gets into the, um, into the wagon to work on her feet, and then there's, again, a, a almost a 25 minute a side that has nothing to do with driving the plot forward but then it brings it's it just i mean it's just all character it's all character, it's all tone, character right? development oh right? yeah it's it's so, flashbacks within flashbacks and again it's what makes you care about the characters is the fact that they're that these things are happening and and they're and it's not like it's boring like you'll watch like um uh, when i when i when reading books i mean when i used to read uh when i read agatha christie i'm like Love the payoff, I said, but getting through the characters and the descriptions of the characters and all that, I yeah. thought, God, there's got to be a more exciting way to do this. And Quentin Tarantino definitely has a way of uh, making you care about the characters and putting in the backstories just because they're cool. They're interesting, right? And the oh, fact yeah. is, because well, and, and he is so interested. So anecdotal and throwaway where he's where um, Bill's introducing the bride to Pai Mai. And there's a few throwaway lines that dead give away what A has happened to L Driver and what's going to happen to her later as well. And you just go, that's such a callback that he gets, he starts using more and more uh, with each uh, progressive movie too. Well, it's funny because you have to be yeah, such a cinephile. The ultimate, the ultimate in in the, with the blowtorch in the last one. Right? Yeah, ultimately you have to be such a cinephile to pick up on a lot of these references, whether they're from uh, giveaways for the film, if you've seen other films and you know what's going to happen, or yep. if they're a wink to the camera for films that he's seen. And, you know, I'll not even in the same category because I'm looking through, I'm on IMDb looking at all the references. I'm like, holy crap, I missed that. I missed that. I missed that. You know, and well, I don't know about that. That's, that's well, pretty amazing. One, like, I remember this one uh, again, right? Once you get into the insight of him a little bit and how he's operating, um, like, again, we were talking about with Jackie Brown, where he realized he doesn't have to get new music. He can just license existing stuff that he likes because, hey, he's, they've got the budget for it. Yeah. That point. Well, the, the soundtrack for this and I got to find it somewhere because I think I bought it from your store. It's a four pack of Lee Van Cleef, you know, uh, spaghetti Westerns from the seventies. But if you were to take the soundtrack from the four different unrelated movies, but in the order that they play on that disc and put it into the kill bill soundtrack, it's very close because well, he, the kill the kill bill soundtrack. Yes. He had a big story about uh, this when he was in Japan, meeting the six, seven, eight. Yep. He was, and he, he just was bought a clothing the store, yep. heard the music, loved it. You know, it's Japanese take on seventies, sixties surf music. I have to buy the CD. He just he buys it from the from the clothing store that he's in. And of course, they actually happen to be in the movie now. And of course, that's the big that woohoo number uh, is kind of iconic for the film. Everything yes. else, I mean, you're listening to score material uh, for a lot of it. But then again, uh, that one is probably the most memorable from uh, the series of film, that and films. That and of course, there's the um, uh, the Wu Tang Clan. Um, yes. Theme. Uh, but that's from again from a different movie from the 70s that nobody remembers the battle without honor and, and humanity or whatever it is and uh, what i love about tarantino is the fact that he's he's being honest oh yeah i took that you know this, this yep. descending this this burial scene that the, the coffin scene uh, is directly lifted from yep. uh, a paul newman movie that he saw that uh, i've never seen or uh, well, so i, 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 I love know, the fact that you give, give credit where credit's due but again 
you're taking just a trope, you're taking something and making it your own. So to me, there's nothing to really apologize for. No, and that's the language of filmmakers do where, it. You know, where you get, I can just think of a thousand ones now where, you know, where we've already talked about them in this series where you go, oh, well, when Bruce Willis sees Ving Rhames crossing the street or vice versa, Ving Rhames, well, that's, you know, that's right at the beginning of Psycho, but that's okay because you know where he got it from and he's not hiding that he didn't. I was going to say, he lifted that right from the Simpsons. Yeah, he's not saying he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's not saying he invented it. He's just saying, uh, oh, I, got donuts. Use it, uh, I got donuts. Uh, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> And then Wham. the other one um, in, in Kill Bill, there's another uh, movie. Uh, uh, I'm gonna call uh, man. I'm gonna draw a blank on Lady Bloodstrike or Lady Moonstrike. Lady, similar to the um, the Lucy. Lady Vengeance. Uh, no, uh, something like uh, there's certainly blood or moon in it because of the the, okay. the the scene or the the set is very similar to the House of Blue Leaves, right? Where there's yeah. Know, so uh, just, Lady Whirlwind is the only other one that I can think of. Yeah, um, but. Uh, the cool part, again, if you look at the uh, at uh, Uma Thurman's outfit in this, this is a direct homage to Bruce Lee's last film, uh, Fist yep. of Fury, where he's wearing pretty much the same outfit. Game of outfit. Death, yeah. Game of so, Death. Yeah. Or Game of Death, yeah. So this is a, that, that was a pretty cool kind of homage to uh, to that genre of film. So, and if anybody, again, anybody and in dirty, the comments, we'll give, we'll give you a prize. If anybody could tell us what, uh, the first person, not anybody, that what's written on the bottom of uh, Uma's feet in the, uh, on her shoes in the uh, wearing that outfit. You can see the second, the, se the second one that probably people know by now, but again, it's always think, what is the bride's real name? Yeah. And, and it's said in the movie. It's just, you don't realize it's a name. You don't realize. Yeah. You have to look for it. I didn't catch it until, uh, until people told me to look for it. And I said, okay, there and it is. It's also, it's also shows up in print when uh, I think she's buying one of the plane tickets, but again, if I, well, that's where you, that's where I got it from. So the yeah. plane ticket uh, has her name on it. Yeah, well, so again, one time, a, at one point, a, I, I figured that, that this is something that everybody knows now because that there's a meme and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, yeah, what did you know? Well, I think I, Bill even know. calls her by her name at one point, but they just you just don't realize it's her name. You think it's yeah. Her. But uh, again, and then the violence in this one kind of threw a lot of people uh, because <laughs> uh, <off> <laughs> uh, Greg Nicotaro actually uh, lended his hands to do a lot of this gore work. Um, Who's, who's the Walking Dead producer of the Walking Dead and all that, and again mm -hmm. worked with Tom Savini. He's kind of uh, right hand man there for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, the violence is. I remember people seeing it, going, you know, I really liked the movie until it did that. And again, you're again, he's he's uh, channeling uh, the movies from the '70s where the gore was outrageous, this grindhouse stuff, and it was ridiculous. And again, if you go to anime, he's kind of a tipping his hat to anime as well. Cause that's what the blood is like in some of these anime films. So well, in his anime sequence, that's all it is too, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, it's but so it's happening in real life, which makes it, which makes it quite funny. I mean, like, and again, I don't know if people are offended by that. I don't find when somebody, you know, okay, whatever the, the injury or the death, if you will. And then the, the resulting blood spray effect is, is for lack of a better word, the guy putting his thumb on a hose and it, it you know, well, that's not realistic, but man, does it stylize and look good. Yeah. To me, All six liters you know, of blood just... It's, it's, yeah, like it's, it's, to me, it's unrealistic, but, you know, that's why it's, to me, the rating could be lower than it is. And I mean, the, the you know, the NC-17R... And again, re really, you're only worried about the, the crazy idiot, the Lucy Liu, uh, yeah. House of Palm Leaves uh, se segment is basically where that kind of cartoon gore, but again, it's uh, it's tipping its hat to that genre of film. So yeah. if, you, if you haven't seen the film and that, you know, be forewarned that this is this is what's going to happen and you might, might take you out of the film, but if you're prepared for it, I didn't bother then, me. I thought it was kind of cool. Get, yeah, and there's a couple of situations in the hospital that might have to explain to kids what's going on. But uh, like, and then when you get to the second movie, uh, with the exception of one business with one of the characters, um, I don't think there's that much violence in the second one. No, other than the rock salt shotgun. Yeah, but we're talking about, yeah. Or is that the end of we're Talking about a touch one. of death, like literally a yeah. touch of death, and then uh, what happens to L Driver there. But other yeah, L, L, L Driver yeah. and then touch of, touch of death, you know, really. And again, you've uh, got, so, got a few more flashbacks and all that. And again, a lot of it is the stuff that they talk about too, right? So, you know, uh, your mind is a lot more powerful than anything that you're going to see on camera. Well, and I think the first one sets up what, you know, oh my God, what's the second one going to be? And you realize it's a different movie because then he is rolling into the spaghetti Western more and the black exploitation compared to the most, yeah, most, most, most definitely. So he's got definitely segments to his films where this is where this, this, you know, this character is going to be uh, an homage to this, this character is going to be an homage to that. Um, uh, really cool. I mean, definitely, definitely a guy that works in a video store, right? Oh, for sure. And passionate, passionate, passionate I mean, film. 
you and you can see his you know his again where he's comparing himself to the top four or five he's not you know jobber of the week or say jay lee thompson where okay he's he's done three films in the crime genre this one's almost every genre kitchen sink before he goes into clearly more defined this is my war movie this is my western here we go but this was pretty cool what was also cool about this one is if you look at the very end uh, it's dedicated yep. to charles bronson who actually died uh, yes. 2003 so before i mean it was already taken place but there's uh dedicated to charles bronson so it would have been awesome if uh tarantino had been able to work with him before before that but i always i always like the film and i always stay tuned just to see that i can and i can uh, kill bill 2 is the one uh it's the only movie with the exception of reservoir dogs of tarantino's that i haven't seen in the theater it holds that distinction i rented it but uh, otherwise, all of mine have been uh, in the theater, so to speak. So that's how I, 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 I just remember. I can remember where I viewed all of his movies, but this one certainly is. Uh, I, think, I think actually all, almost all of them I've seen. Uh, I think I know I saw Pulp Fiction in the theater. Um, uh, From Dusk Till Dawn, I saw in the theater. In Glorious, I waited till home video because I got a, an advanced screener because I owned a video store and I got that. Um, yeah, no, actually, I think that most of his stuff I haven't seen. So we're kind of the opposite. I think there's only two of his that I've actually seen in the theater. And I make and, it a point, uh, right? I mean, that's now, right? Well, I'm clearly since Pulp Fiction, right? But yeah, this one, uh, Kill Bill, there's always that third option because then also, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure Quentin will agree with me, um, it allows him to make an, an 11th movie because if he was to do a third Kill Bill, I don't think that would count in his big uh, overture of 10, right? Well, and again, that whole thing with 10, I mean, which ten or ten? Which ten or ten are is ten? Well, I mean, ten are the ones that he his, writes and directs. No, he's talking his direction, right? So the only yeah. the only loophole is if you count Kill Bill all as one movie, then okay, he could conceivably make three or four Kill Bills and still because we've never ever seen in Hollywood where people have gone back on uh, how many they figured how many mill never, movies yeah. they were going to make, right? He seems to be sticking to it though. I think. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, you get bored and all that, and you have more stories to tell. Well, he's going to. You know, I don't, think, I don't think anybody's going to complain. Let's put it that way. He's getting into theater next. All right. Yeah. He'd be a founder. Oh, founder. But yeah, I mean, this one, uh, the, the sequel's there. The kids uh, that were kids are now in their 20s. Maya Hawk, um, whoever would be playing uh, Vivica A. Fox's daughter. And then, of course, Uma Thurman's daughter in real life um, uh, as well. Maya there would work uh, as the playing the bride. In addition to the, the actress that played the bride in the first movie, who shows up in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. Mm-hmm. she's the uh she's the hippie that sells cliff the uh, the the acid cigarette so uh anything more you want to cover on the kill bills kill bill uh no i um it, it came out in the era of the matrix which i think was why the weinstein said though okay we can put them out instead of one big one we can uh, we can cut these up i'm always curious because he never did throw that you know one cut together whether you can get it in one you know, extended uh, viewing, so to see. Well, over over three hours has always been a has always been a kiss of death. Yeah, like uh, when you get back to the sixties and sixties, and they used to make like six hour, like Cleopatra's a six hour film. Uh, and again, Same. box office on that. I mean, that was something when you didn't have anything else to do except go to the theater. Yeah. Uh, that was a popular thing to do. And now we have all these other things, and people want stuff faster. We've gone from uh, hour long shows to half an hour shows to fifteen minute shows. Uh, mostly cartoons, but uh, you know our our intention spans as a as a as a whole are getting lower. So, which is so weird because there, when you th- when you think about it, you could go, okay, are you gonna you could like I mean just pick what's going on right now. Okay, uh, James Gunn wants to do a seven hour Peacemaker movie. Uh, no, nobody will listen to it. Yeah, or nobody will watch it. Yeah, but if he drops seven episodes. Yeah, going to Netflix all, all at once. Everybody will binge watch it, and everyone can binge right through it, right? Yeah. But again, yeah. they're in the comfort of their own home, where they can get their own snack in their own bathroom and whatever, and they can pause yeah. it whenever they want. Uh, I think the last film that I ever went to the theater to see that actually had uh, um, had a uh, intermission was uh, uh, Macbeth. Kenneth Branagh's. No. Yeah. That would be the law. Yeah, the uncut. No, Hamlet. No, Kent's pronounced Hamlet. Hamlet, sorry. Hamlet. Yeah, the uncut where he gets he gets a nomination for best uh, screenplay adaptation when he didn't adapt them. <laughs> so I remember they we actually left the theater, walked out, and they said it went to intermission. And so I figured, oh, okay, go out and walk a little bit. Because it was a four-hour film, pretty yeah. close to four hours. We yeah. walked around and all that. And I actually have had a DVD for 
hell was it? It wasn't Kelly's Heroes. It was it might have been it. It was something else. Re, it was a war film that was really long. Okay. And I remember going out. It said, and it just goes to I think the VHS copy, and it went to went to intermission. I'm like, holy shit, look at that. Is that the Kelly's Heroes or, or Dirty Dozen or something or, like uh, that? I can think of a, there's a couple like that. A Bridge Too Far, maybe, or something like that. Could have been. I can't remember, but I just remember being stunned. I'm like, I've never seen that before. And of course, during the whole intermission, which actually only lasts uh, not even, about five minutes, and it's they're just whistling the whole theme over and over yeah. and over again. I'm like, oh, so you're not going to sit there and watch it. Well, it's um, funny. I'm uh, at 85 minutes. If it clocks in at the right time, I, su- I, I still think Sakunka might have an intermission right at minute 44. And you go, what is this? <laughs> that would be <laughs> awesome. They get, let's go down to the lobby. Yeah, yeah. Let's go out to the lobby. Uh, Tarantino's got to do that. Like that's Talk what about I loved about, uh, uh, that's what I loved about death proof is the fact that, uh, is that you know that whole thing like the, just the intro and all that kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah. yeah. So are we do which one are we do? We're doing that one next. That's Death Proof is uh, next, and then that's his next one. You uh, want to take a break now or go? Uh... Oh, we can do Death Proof. I got another ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah Death Proof. Uh, uh, recently, uh, Tarantino, Tarantino came out and said this is his worst movie, and well, it's his left hander for sure. Yeah. Again, this is supposed to be a grindhouse picture, which grindhouse pictures, if you're familiar, aren't good films. They're entertaining films. Yep. but they're not good. They're not technically good. And even at that, some of the stuff in here is, is pretty good. It's not his, um, yeah, definitely not his, it's probably his lowest rated. And oh, for sure. you know, when, when they released these back to back, so Rodriguez had planet terror and we had death proof and planet terror did the, I think accounted for 75% of the revenue. Uh, and again, uh, even, even the ratings on it, people going to see it. I liked planet terror way better. So um, yeah, they're different. Again, I think we've had this discussion and I've said it before, even on this, right? One of them is a better movie and one of them is the better film. Um, and Planet Terror is easily the more entertaining movie. Oh, yeah. Most, most, most definitely. And again, uh, and then Tarantino's got a little bit of a part, got, got, got an acting role in that one. But uh, if you go and watch uh, Death Proof, I mean, Death Proof is more kind of a, a writer's film where you're looking at, even though the idea is of a car that kills people with a stunt, or gets you in there and then he rolls the car and, you know, serial killer that way. And of course, the ending is classic freaking, I can't tell you how many scene, how many movies I've seen from that era of that kind of ilk, where it just ends. And I mean, horror films, action films where, you know, he comes up, I remember watching one, I think it was uh, Satan's Daughter or something like that, where the guy had a stick. And he yeah. comes up to the main bad guy and he hits him in the head and the end. That was it. I'm like, fuck, did they cut the film? Like, what the hell? What's going on? What's well, going it's, on? It's, like, it's almost... and, cre- and then credits roll by really fast, right? Or flush by your ass. I'm like, okay, I don't know what happened with the budget here. If there was one that was comprised of bottles found in the ditches. But, uh, you know, he's able to even take that and go, that happens a lot. So we're going to make it happen here. You know, they're beating the crap out of Kurt Russell. So we got Kurt Russell. Um, uh, is in this one. Rose McGowan has a role in this. Uh, uh, Tarantino. Mostly, it's their fi- it's their film, so it's Kurt Russell's film essentially. Rosario Dawson is the other. Yeah, Rosario Dawson. Um, and then, I mean, the big uh, the big. I mean, again, right? The last one. He, you know, okay, Kill Bill. He's proven he can direct action. Um, and you know, okay, if you're gonna consider action directors, there's one all of a sudden. And in this one, it's almost like he says, okay, I got to uh, I got to throw my car chase hat into the ring, and. Uh, all that stuff with Zoe Bell is yeah. fantastic. And I guess my favorite part of the favorite part of the whole thing when you put the whole pack together were the faux trailers. So Eli Roth did a trailer, yeah. Rob Zombie did a trailer for uh, and I've never seen the Rob Zombie one. It's it's a it's an Ilsa She Wolf of the SS. It's, it's great. One. It's great. Nick Cage shows up as Fu Manchu. Oh, I've never seen it. I've never been able to find it. Yeah. And then of course, uh, thanks kit was it thanks killing? Eli Roth's yeah, well, I think it's just Thanksgiving, yeah, and then there's Thanksgiving. Another, I think it's uh, Thanksgiving Watson. or something like that. Yeah, and then yeah. Uh, what was the other, the other one? Was Machete? And Machete yeah. got built into actual film with Danny Trio, and of course, a lot of the Rodriguez Tarantino uh, supporting players were in that, which is a freaking awesome film. I don't yep. know, Tarantino wasn't uh, he didn't he had nothing to do with that. That was just Rodriguez. That one wasn't it? Which what's up, Machete? Machete. Yeah, other than you know, machete and machete. Yeah, thank you. I, and Danny Trio's getting a little bit long in the tooth to do uh, tri- or uh, machete in space, but man, that would still be good. And, right up uh, there with Jason Voorhees and Leprechaun and uh, all the other guys that go into space. When you all think the other yeah, icons, and the, and then again, you see that this one. I, I think you really see the difference between um, if if you can't tell the difference between Rodriguez and, and Tarantino, where 
okay, they're both doing grindos, so they're both doing horror movies, whereas and Tarantino's referencing Hollywood in this case, a lot of cases, right? All the stroker ace jokes and you know, falling out of his time machine and stuff. And then uh, on the other side, you got Robert Rodriguez, where okay, here's his carpenter bit. Here's his yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely and, absolutely. Just, and then and you again, go okay it's much and more again around. the two there's a, there's definitely you know pacing issues with the two so you've got the one of them and i mean rodriguez is intentionally over the top kind of silly grindhouse yeah. whereas uh tarantino's is more of a gritty uh a little more realistic kind of uh grindhouse, of grindhouse yeah. that that Low you budget. that it wasn't a lot of fun. more kind of like craven's last house on the wet on the on the left right i mean it's yeah. not good but it's it's dirty raunchy and prob- probably realistic so well i mean at uh, the end of the day it is a slasher movie if he wasn't using his car right? yeah exactly exactly which is, is pretty much what it is and of course you got uh, again uh, another you got a pretty decent soundtrack on this one uh you put the whole thing together and i think that's the way that it should be released as uh yeah. The, the full the full uh, uh two piece with the uh three or four i think it's just three um uh, or maybe four uh, Tony uh trailers yeah. trailers yeah and just just have a blast with it because it's just it's just like going to the old grindhouse theaters of the 70s and early 80s uh to see these kind of thing well, i mean my done done by the time i was a kid but i read about it i mean i was really into the grand vignol and was talking about the american equivalent uh, the 60s and 70s, which, of course, was the grindhouse kind of films where, you know, in order to get people to watch, you mean to make a movie was still expensive. Uh, you do it. But again, what sells is sex and violence. So yep. you, you load it up with sex and violence and you get some sort of a half ass story going. Uh, nobody people that you've never heard of before. Most of them can't act. Uh, <laughs> but again, you, 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 you show you, you get a bunch of naked chicks and a bunch of guys and some bad special uh, gore effects. And there you go. You got a film. Ingredients for a movie. Yeah, Sidney Poitier's daughter's in this one too. And um, and then, of course, Michael and James Parks again playing uh, Ranger Earl and Edgar McGraw. Yeah. So, and, and then I think there's some crossover. Some of the actors show up in both movies too. Um, I think uh, Marley Shelton does. And then the guy, the, the, she's the one married to Josh Brolin in, in Planet Terror, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Just up for a second in the Earl McGraw. And they use Earl McGraw again, lessons in filmmaking. If you notice, Earl McGraw is used in every... Um, um movie as the pl- if, in case you missed the first half of the movie we bring earl mcgraw in to catch everybody back up and he just gives you what you've seen for the last yeah he's a, he's a device Great. yeah and and earl mcgraw i mean in this one he comes in in the middle of the movie and he essentially tells you what the plot is well i think that man killed those girls and he's going to do it again and, yep. <laughs> and here we are again j- just to dumb it down for you in case you can't follow along and then the most brilliant, it up and spit it brilliant out for one you. is in, in Death Proof. There's a couple, like, I mean, Bruce Willis is in that playing Bruce Willis, of course, um, playing the guy who killed Bin Laden, of course. Um, mm. But the, uh, the the use of the missing reel in in, in, in Planet Terror is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's again. talking about his barbecue sauce and then missing reel and the entire restaurant's on fire. You don't know what happened. And it's, you clearly lost 20 minutes of plot. But it's, and again, with with Planet Terror, I mean, the casting is so awesome yeah. in that one. And that's one you can just tell uh, Tarantino said, OK, unless Rodriguez had seen it, uh, he said, you got to get uh, Jeff Fahey. You got to yep. get uh, uh, Michael Bean, You got to get Tom yeah. Savini. You got to get. Yeah. it Awesome. Awesome stuff. So again, uh, and again, Rodriguez used a lot of the same guys. So uh, from um, uh, Sin City. So. Um, but, very, uh, no, you're you're right though. I mean, to me, same with Kill Bill. Uh, seeing these together, back to back, the whole bloody affair, or these two together, is the way to go. Um, yeah, yeah, Def- and de- definitely allow you if you watch them back to back. Definitely let you to kind of judge. I said, okay, well, here's this kind of film. Here's this kind of film. Makes sense. Rather than it, it. I mean, they could have easily. Uh, it'd be, again, interesting to see if they had switched uh, switched films. Uh, to direct different films to see how it would have turned out but uh again yeah, good, good, both good. are both are a blast both are definitely worth it um again being a fun film not his again he went out and said tarantino himself said uh probably his worst film yeah again, well, he goes, he goes, as far as left-handed films this is the only one i got and yeah and again i mean, yeah, and, I mean rodriguez, that, can even, yeah. rodriguez can even say the same thing all right i mean it's a grindhouse film what are you expecting yeah. and he's gonna be up for yeah. an oscar i mean it, so. rodriguez is currently directing the mandalorian so it's a different look so, you know yeah i mean you can turn it into spy kids right yep exactly yeah all right I'm gonna, I'm gonna head up we'll leave her there and then uh we'll pick up on it again uh when do you figure uh, well i'll pause this for 